Welcome back to our study of 1 Samuel. We are uh, rounding the final corner and approaching the end. We've just got a few of these left. And as a matter of fact, in terms of the overall narrative of what we call 1 Samuel, we kind of completed it in the last session, uh, reaching the end of Saul's life, and that marks the turn from 1 Samuel to 2 Samuel. There are a couple of stories, though, that have occurred in that last major portion that we looked at that I think probably merit some specific attention. So in the next session, we're going to look at Saul and his visit to the Witch of Endor. And in this particular one, we're going to look at Abigail. Abigail is not only one of my favorite characters in 1 Samuel, but really in the entirety of the Bible. I love pretty much everything about this story. And so let me read to you from 1 Samuel chapter 25, and then we'll make some observations about what we see in this account. It starts like this. Now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him, and they buried him at his home in Ramah. Then David moved down into the desert of Paran. A certain man in Ma'on, who had property there at Carmel, was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband was surly and mean in his dealings. He was a Calebite. While David was in the wilderness, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep, and so he sent ten young men and said to them, Go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Say to him, Long life to you, good health to you, and your whole household, and good health to all that is yours. Now I hear that it is sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them, and the whole time they were with Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. Ask your servants, and they will tell you. Therefore, be favorable toward my men, since we come at a festive time. Please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. So just pausing for a moment, David is essentially sending his men on a mission to this man, Nabal. And he he says, once you go to him and and be very polite and kind about this and and make very clear that, you know, we've taken care of his people, we've we've really been his servant, and and now we need him to provide some things for us. That's what Paul, uh, that's what David is saying. Verse 9, when David's men arrived, they gave Nabal this message in David's name. Then they waited. Nabal answered David's servants, Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered from my shears and give it to men coming from who knows where? So David's men turned around and went back. And when they arrived, they reported every word. The words matter here. David said to his men, verse 13, David said to his men, each of you strap on your sword. So they did, and David strapped his on as well. About 400 men went up with David, while 200 stayed with the supplies. One of the servants told Abigail, Nabal's wife, David sent messengers from the wilderness to give our master his greetings, but he hurled insults at them. Yet these men were very good to us. They did not mistreat us, and the whole time we were out in the field near them, nothing was missing. Night and day they were a wall around us the whole time we were herding our sheep near them. Now think it over and see what you can do, because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. Abigail acted quickly. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five seahs of roasted grain, 100 cakes of raisin, and 200 cakes of pressed figs, and loaded them on the donkeys. Then she told her servants, go on ahead, I'll follow you. But she did not tell her her husband, Nabal. She came riding her donkey into a mountain ravine there As she came riding her donkey into a mountain ravine, there were David and his men descending toward her, and she met them. David had just said, It's been useless, all my watching over this fellow's property in the wilderness so that nothing of his was missing. He has paid me back evil for good. May God deal with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning I leave alive one male of all who belongs to him. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed down before David with her face to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, Pardon your servant, my lord, and let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. Please pay no attention, my lord, to that wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name means fool, and folly goes with him. And as for me, your servant, I did not see the men my lord sent. And now, my lord, as surely as the lord your God lives and as you live, since the lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my lord be like Nabal. And let this gift which your servant has brought to my Lord, be given to the men who follow you. Please forgive your servant's presumption. The Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord, because you fight the Lord's battles, and no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, the life of my Lord will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God, but the lives of your enemies he will hurl away as from the pocket of a sling. When the Lord has fulfilled for my Lord every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him ruler over Israel, my Lord will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or of having avenged himself. And then the Lord your God has brought my Lord's success. Remember your servant. David said to Abigail, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet me. 
May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, who has kept me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, not one male belonging to Nabal would have been left alive by daybreak. And then David accepted from her hand what she had brought him and said, Go home in peace. I have heard your words and granted your request. When Abigail went to Nabal, he was in the house holding a banquet like that of a king. He was in high spirits and very drunk. So she, sold, so, so she told him nothing at all until daybreak. Then in the morning, when Nabal was sober, his wife told him all these things, and his heart failed him, and he became like a stone. About ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Praise be to the Lord, who has upheld my cause against Nabal for treating me with contempt. He has kept his own servant from doing wrong, and has brought Nabal's wrongdoing down on his own head. And then David sent word to Abigail, asking her to become his wife. His servants went to Carmel and said to Abigail, David has sent to us to take you to become his wife. She bowed down with her face to the ground and said, I am your servant and ready to serve you and wash the feet of my Lord's servants. Abigail quickly got on a donkey and, attended by her five female servants, went with David's messengers and became his wife. David had also married Hinnom of Jezreel, and they both were his wives. But Saul had given his daughter Michael, Michal, David's wife, to Paltiel, son of Laish, who was from Galim. This is a fascinating story. And it repays reading again and again and again. And, uh, you know, we talked early on in this in this uh, study of 1 Samuel about how whenever you're reading the narratives in the Bible, in a book like 1 Samuel, you've got to read them on multiple levels. And that's precisely what I want to do with this story. If we're going to understand um, some measure of what God has saying to us, is saying to us through this, then we've got to do precisely this. And there's a couple of different things that we would note in this regard. Uh, maybe on the first level, the most obvious thing is that Abigail prevents unnecessary death. We are looking at a situation in which a lot of people are going to die, and Abigail steps in and stops this from taking place. Uh, her own life does not seem to have been in danger. It is against the males of the household that David had threatened, had, 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 uh, had, had felt himself burned with, with this, uh, this rage to come against. So many others were, and as the text says, Abigail acts quickly. What a pregnant sentence. She acts quickly, she asks, asks, acts decisively, and she acts in contrast to her foolish husband, named Nabal, related to the Hebrew word for fool. Uh, in contrast to him, she acts with wisdom and grace. And so on the first level, what we see here is that Abigail acts in such a way that she prevents unnecessary death. Also, there is a sense in which um, Abigail saves David from becoming Saul. Uh, he's not in the story, but he looms over the story in important ways. And we've noticed already that one of the chief qualifications uh, of David that actually demonstrates his credentials to be king is his consistent refusal to take personal vengeance on Saul. This is something that characterized Saul, the taking of personal vengeance, and it is not something that characterizes David. And as a matter of fact, we're, we're of course studying chapter 25. You may remember that chapter 25 falls in between 24 and 26, of course. 24 is the first time David spared Saul's life when he found himself relieving himself in the cave and he cut off a portion of his cloak. And then the second time, this be, that'd be chapter 24. Chapter 26, on the other side of this, is the second time David spared Saul's life when he uh, came into his camp while Saul and the men were sleeping and he took his water jug and his weapon, his spear. And so you have these multiple times when, when, when David has actually resisted the temptation to vengeance and in between, tucked in between those, you have this story. And so this sandwich, or the technical term is called a chiasm, this structure of narrating the story raises the question, will David uh, continue to resist this temptation and demonstrate himself worthy to be the king? And, uh, and for his part, Nabal looks a lot like Saul. Uh, Old Testament scholar Peter Lightheart calls, calls Nabal Saul's alter ego. And there are a lot of ways in which the narrative presents him as a Saul sort of figure. Uh, Saul admits in the next chapter, chapter 26, that he acted like a fool, which of course is related to the name Nabal. And in this story in particular, we see that Nabal is very wealthy and that he specifically is said to eat like a king. He dines like a king at this banquet that he has thrown. Um, Nabal in chapter 25, verse 11, uses the words I or my uh, 11, uh, eight, eight times in the span of this one verse. Over and over and over, I, my, I, my, they don't all come through in the English, but they're all there in the Hebrew. And so like Saul, who's a character focused on himself, this is what Samuel said he would be. Nabal is a character who's concerned with his own, not with others. And um, also similarly, David had been serving Nabal in the same way that David served Saul and yet Saul came after him. David had been serving Nabal, and yet Nabal doesn't treat him like an honored servant. Instead, he treats him like this, like this, uh, like this rebel, you know, kind of like Saul treated him. 
even though David is honest and has integrity in his dealings with these men, these men treat him like they, some sort of rebel who's, who's coming against them in inappropriate ways. You heard what Nabal said. These days, all kinds of people are breaking away from their master and their servants. Why should I give anything to this particular person? And so even though there's no foul play on Saul, on David's part, Nabal, like Saul, comes after him. And, and, and so Nabal poses a real threat to David. You have to understand this. He he poses a real threat to David, not just his well-being, but again, his credentials for kingship. Because the question is, will uh, David pass the test? And he does. He passes the test and he doesn't look like Saul. And the only reason why he passes the test is because Abigail intervened. Is because she, being beautiful and intelligent and wise and courageous, steps in in inappropriate ways and does everything she can to keep him from disqualifying himself for the role that God promised him. And so we see that Abigail saves uh, the situation from unnecessary death and she saves David from becoming Saul. And, and that alone, honestly, would be enough for her to regard her as something of an important figure for us to remember and even in important ways imitate. But it, it goes on, actually. There are deeper dimensions to this. Again, when you, when you read the story, you want to read it uh, on the level of just, this is a story about real people in a real situation. And then you want to read it within the book in which it's found. This is a story that has something to do with the picture that's being painted for us by 1 Samuel. And then you actually want to read it in light of the Old Testament as a whole. And when we do that, one of the things that we noticed is that Abigail, Abigail here is contrasted to Eve. Now, Genesis 3 is, is very much right underneath the surface of 1 Samuel chapter 25. There are about 80 uses of the words good and evil in 1 Samuel, and one third of them occur in this particular chapter. And you have, of course, in, in, in Genesis 3, the three of the knowledge of, of good and evil and the temptation between the two. And, and of course, the temptation here is to, is are you going to trust that God will give you wisdom in time or are you going to reach out and grab hold of the fruit that gives you wisdom right now? And so these themes of wisdom and foolishness, of course, relate to this story. Now, Baal's name means fool and he demonstrates this in the way he behaves. By contrast, of course, Abigail is wise and her wisdom contrasts not only uh, Nabal, her husband, but Eve, her mother. And so the comparison begins to grow as we think through these things. Eve led her husband, Adam, into sin. And by way of contrast, Abigail not only refuses to be brought down by her foolish husband, Nabal, but instead raises David up in a story in which she becomes his wife. And so you begin to see some contrasts here, uh, even especially when you think about um, more deeply the task that God had given to Adam and Eve. God made Adam and Eve kind of king and queen, and, and they were the first humans who, who were given this task of ruling on behalf of the God, being his image. This is royal language in the Genesis context, and so Adam and Eve were created to rule under God's supreme authority as these the first of these delegated kings and queens. And we've already noticed in the story of 1 Samuel that David in certain ways is sort of like a new Adam a worthy replacement of God's first fallen son. And now we see Abigail as a worthy replacement of God's first fallen daughter. Abigail contrasts Eve. And that, again, enough. That's amazing. That's so great to see that there's these multiple resonances of what's going on here. But we need to, of course, take it one more level. If you want to understand the Old Testament, you always have to ask, how is it that this story points forward to the story as a whole? And the fourth thing that I want to notice about Abigail is that she echoes Samuel, and what's more, she prefigures Christ. So there's certain ways in which she, of course, looks a lot like Samuel, but most significantly, she actually, I think, functions as a type of Christ. We'll maybe see some of the Samuel connections as we unpack the Jesus connections. Uh, there's a general sense in which she she saves God's people from the consequences of their planned sin. And so there's this sort of general overlap, and that probably in and of itself would be a valuable lesson, but we might find ourselves skeptical of whether the author presents Abigail in such a way. Well, let's let's dig a little deeper. What I want you to notice here is that she actually serves in many ways as both a priest and a prophet before the king. From a priestly standpoint, she brings together this meal and she sort of offers it to David, not quite as a sacrifice, that would be inappropriate to go too far in this regard, but she offers this meal that brings about reconciliation. And so in certain ways, she's acting in a priestly fashion and, and gosh, the prophetic piece is, is even clearer. We remember that this story begins by noting that Samuel has actually died. And why report Samuel's death? It's been a long time since this happened. And, and the reason why is because it's actually been Samuel who is the reliable mouthpiece of God. It's been Samuel that the one that the, these kings can count on to bring the word of the Lord. And, and so now that Samuel's gone, the question is, where will David turn? And is, is there a prophet in Israel who will guide the king in the proper direction? And, and the answer to the question is, yes, there is. And her name is Abigail. She proves 
proves worthy of taking the mantle of Samuel. And what's more, of course, is that in both of those ways, perhaps it's that Abigail sort of points backward to Samuel and both of them point forward to Christ, who comes and fulfills not only the priestly and prophetic offices, but also the office of king. And while the, par- while the parallels are, are partial, they're nevertheless real and important for us to see that Abigail actually points us forward to the identity and work, the person and mission of, of Jesus himself, our great priest and prophet and, yes, our king. And in some ways, this realization transitions us naturally to probably the two most important takeaways for us with respect to this story. Part of what we can just do is meditate on these wonderful things and and see all sorts of wisdom in Abigail. And if I could pull out two things that are probably worth mentioning, one of the things I want to notice here is, is the critical participation of women in God's redemptive mission. And I don't want to do more than is warranted by the text. I mean, not all story about a woman, not all stories about a woman are stories about women. But I do think there's an important thing here, especially given the contrast between Abigail and Eve. So it's sort of like Eve helped make this mess and Abigail is going to help clean it up. And within this, you have these sort of fascinating takes, if you will, or fascinating um, tweaks on, on the role of woman, maybe in a couple of ways. I want you to notice what takes place here. She actually honors God by undermining her foolish husband. And this is not the first time we've seen something like this, where women who find themselves in in a powerless position actually um, overcome the oppressive tyrant on top by acting in ways that are sneaky. I mean, you, of course, think of the midwives of Pharaoh and at the beginning of the book of Exodus. But maybe in this regard, within the marriage context, you think about Rebecca. She often gets flack for manipulating the situation so that Jacob received the blessing. But God has made clear that the blessing is to go to Jacob. And it seems like Isaac is the one who's not interested in listening to the prophecy. And so Rebecca is forced to take it upon herself to bring this about. And I know that's a contested text, but this one is, is, is certainly clear that Abigail actually acts righteously by, by not falling in line with this foolish husband that she's married. And And so, of course, while this does not negate the the relevance and value and staying power of a central text, such as maybe Ephesians 5 or or, or Colossians chapter 3, we need to discipline our understanding of a godly wife to make room for for Abigail's God-honoring defiance. That's one way in which you see the role here tweaked a bit. And the second way is, um, I think, also important to keep in mind, especially as we uh, want to hold up certain characters in the Bible as examples for our young men and women, and in this case, in the gender-specific line, I think it's maybe valuable as a, as a counteracting point to some of what's going on in our current world. And of course, while Abigail, by the end of the story, takes her place in the narrative as, as the wife of the future king, her ascent to this place is hardly passive. She is anything but a passive actor here. And indeed, it involves leading men towards, towards the blessing of God, towards God good for everybody. And What's more, I think, about this is unlike many modern portrayals of heroic women that essentially put women in the position of hero by um, forcing them to act like men, right? And you have these stories where the the woman actually conquers because she is the physically dominant uh, character in the story. And and, and this is, of course, an option that is not available to like 99% of women. Instead of a characterization like this, which may have its place, but at the same time has its limitations, Abigail, I want you to notice, Abigail leads the men by... Well, if you will, fighting like a woman. There's some beauty that you see here in terms of the picture of Abigail as this this one who participates in moving God's missions forward in some notable ways. And and then the final thing uh, for us to to keep in mind here has to do with uh, maybe more general, the the issue of temptation. And the lesson that we see here from Abigail's intervention in David's life is that God will always provide a way out if only we will step up under it. So God will allow us to be tested Uh, This is what happened in the stories of these kings over and over and over again. And it's what happens in the story of our lives as well. And briefly, if we could make this point that God will always allow us to be tested, but he will also always provide a way out. He'll always provide a word, a path. If only we'll take it. You think probably about 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has seized any of you except what is common to all of us. And God is faithful to provide a way out. If only we will stand up in it. And so we might do well to recognize that in this story, David doesn't just say, Abigail, you're so wonderful. He does, but he says, the Lord has sent you, chapter 25, verse 32, the Lord has sent you to me for just this purpose that you would save me from the foolishness I had planned. And so for us, maybe the point to consider as we close is that we need to keep our eyes open for our Abigail 
And, and, when, and when we find her, or maybe, maybe better put, when she finds you, listen to her and let her lead you further along the path to life. <laughs>